there was uh, our speaker um, was not able to attend today. Uh, my role this morning was to introduce the speaker, uh, Dr. Christian Parenti, um, but he, he's not joining us. He, we were informed yesterday that he will. Um, he was unable to attend and left the following statement. <clears throat> the bulk used clothing industry is heavily implicated in the story of de-industrialization of textile industries around the world. This uh, statement is, well, we'll, we'll talk about this, or I'll talk about this now. But uh, basically, it's, we're, it's informing us that um, Textile industries making new clothes are affected by the business that we are in. Um, his absence is unfortunate on many levels, not least because of the last minute notice, uh, but we would like to have heard from him on climate change and how it's affecting the globe. Um, however, his statement, as you can see, uh, reminds us of the ongoing need for education and exploration of the true impact of used clothing in, in the world. Those in this room know that the that our industry is often too uh, misrepresented in the media uh, or, out by, or outdated information. I want to take this time we've been granted to review the importance of used clothing and the impact of used clothing in the world today. Um, it is true that many parts of the world are faced with chronic economic infrastructure problems together with widespread corruption and many of us in this room live, work, and, uh, and travel to these places. We felt called to protect and uplift the human rights of those struggling in poverty. Uh, when we see this poverty in, in the world, we look for the culprit and we look to point a finger. Uh, perhaps finding some, someone to blame makes us feel better. But the reality of global economics is it is complicated. Uh, it is true that since the 1980s, the textile industry in nearly all places around the world with the exception of Asia, has been in a free fall. Uh, when we turn to East Africa specifically, we see that local textile manufacturing industry is struggling in the same places where used clothing is very popular. Uh, but just because two things occur together does not mean that one has caused the other. And while it is easy to reduce this complicated economic picture to one factor, or blame economic difficulties in East Africa in other places like that on used clothing, it simply is not the truth. So what does explain the struggling indigenous textile market in a place like East Africa? There are many complex reasons. First, just like the few remaining textile manufacturers here in the United States, in the Southeast region specifically, African companies face stiff direct competition from imports of cheap new clothing from countries like China India, and Bangladesh. In fact, China is the largest exporter of textiles in the world, with 274 million sales, I'm sorry, 274 billion sales in 2013, which is nearly seven times more than the, the second most, which is India at 40 billion. Over a 30-year period beginning in the 1980s, uh, cheap labor and superior infrastructure gave China a uh, dominant dominance over the export market, and we saw a major shift in textile manufacturing centers closing or relocating uh, during this time. Protectors, protections were, placed, were put in place under the multi-fiber agreement, the MFA, which expired in two, 2005. I'm sure that you've been in the business for a long time, uh, remember that. This effectively restricted Chinese exports, and African countries were able to compete. However, the MFA uh, expiration in 2005. Uh, months after that, uh, China, exports from China to the region grew over 100%. Uh, ever, since, ever since then, many African textile producers have struggled to compete globally. Further, infrastructure problems often have a crippling effect on local manufacturers. Resources such as le electricity are expensive and unreliable which is an impact on productivity. Shipping and transport can be difficult to result in, de and result in delays. For textile manufacturers specifically that compete in the global market, poor infrastructure can be devastating. 
to suggest that used clothing is solely, solely to blame for Africa's struggling textile economy does a great disservice to the real problems that plague economic development. There are simply no, da no data to support this claim. However, threats to ban the used clothing industry or restrict imports still persist, as per our... Um, to suggest that used clothing is solely to blame for Africa's struggling economy does a great disservice to the real problems that plague economic de development. There are threats to the ban used clothing industry. Um, these ideas put a risk that the well-being well and prosperity of tens of millions of people that the used clothing industry employs. The used textile industry benefits people around the world. One can think of it as an informal industry. Matthias talked a little about informal industries, which is best described as um, you know, industries that are not, uh, do, do not have government data, like the flea markets in the US, and et cetera. Um, it's, informal economies have a full impact, cannot be captured by government data as exist outside the mainstream, but we know that this business is crucial to the survival of many people and families around the globe. Our African partners repeatedly point out the importance of the second-hand clothing trade for the employ employment situation. In particular, women in patriarchal societies and young people with few job prospects elsewhere can make a living selling used clothing. In addition, many people primarily buy their clothes from second-hand markets because it is affordable and offers choice. Large sections of the population of many countries can no longer afford locally made clothing. Affordable new clothes from China may be easily available, however, there are often problems with quality. So second-hand clothing is often preferred in these markets. The, set, the sale and distribution of used clothing is an industry in itself, creating thousands of jobs for shippers, uh, the importers, distributors, and small local merchants. Of course, we cannot ignore recycling. Matthias did a very good job talking about the importance and benefits of recycling used textiles. Given that in this country, the average American throws away 70 pounds of used clothing per year, we must strive to find a way to reuse this clothing. Textile manufacturing has a huge negative impact on the environment, from the farming of cotton, other crops, uh, textile dyes, creation and disposal, to the energy and environmentally damaging emissions of textile factories. The used textile industry, and people like us, people like you, uh, promotes innovation in upcycling and downcycling, making our industry a leader in the promoting, in promoting environmental welfare and lessening the consumer footprint. With all the good that used clothing does in, in, the, in our industry, we should be proud of the work that we are doing. We thank you so much for your continued support and hard work that gives back to the world around you and we hope that you enjoy all the learning opportunities we present here today. If you take nothing else with you from today's talks, I hope that you will spin, spread the world around and the good uh, news that used clothing does in your own communities. Um, I'm gonna go with a, a short video, and if you could uh, click on that in the back. This video was uh, created a few years back for an Earth Day, and um, it's it's uh, is for Planet Aid. It was created for Planet Aid, one of our suppliers here. So we will have a roundtable discussion. Oh. Uh, the roundtable discussions that we're going to do after the video, if we are able to watch the four four minute video. Um, each table will have two questions, and uh, we would like you to discuss with the other people around you. And after uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes of discussion, we'll take that opportunity to uh, ask you questions or ask your table to present your, uh, your findings. And we'll do that after the video, because it seems like we have that. Hello. Okay, everyone. 
I hate to cut your conversation short because it seems like you all are doing such a good job. Um, I'm going to ask first of you to, uh, for volunteers uh, to, to describe and talk about one of the questions from your table. Um, I'm sure that we'll have lots of volunteers. Here we are, Steve. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, this is the esteemed table number two. <laughs> Mainly because we have Guy LeBlanc. So table number two's question was uh, supply management. Maybe you missed that we had uh, the esteemed Guy LeBlanc, so I'm going to say that again. So, supply, so our question in front of us was supply chain management, best ways to vet and secure quality supply in an increasingly competitive market. So again, our question in front of us was supply chain management, best ways to vet and secure quality supply in an increasingly competitive market. Um, in the short version, which was Guy LeBlanc's, was um, uh, don't place bins in junky areas. <laughs> the long, uh, and then the, from Midwest Textiles, they talked about the uh, grading process and how um, now they're grading, they're doing less grades but more work on the grades, so they're grading uh, for fashion and they're grading for sizing, uh, but also they're doing more vigorous work on testing the loads that they're buying. Uh, but then we're lucky to have to have Fred from Planet Aid, who uh, really chimed in with some really great things. He said, uh, first of all, we fired our bottom 10% boxes. Uh, so we, we, we went around and we looked at the boxes and said 10% of them we're going to get rid of, we're gonna, which were in the outlying areas, and we're going to focus on the core areas where the better quality product is. Uh, they talked about um, instituting the importance of quality control systems, about spot checking, about how the goods are packaged, how the goods are handled, um, making sure that there was no garbage mixed in, but really focusing on those high dollar yield quality areas. Uh, and that was the, our table's answer to uh, best ways to vet and secure quality supply in an increasingly competitive market. Thank you, Steve. Are there other table volunteers? Here we are. Hello. I'm John. I'm with uh, Planet Aid. And our topic was bin regulation. What are the challenges in bin collection in your respective city or state? Uh, we had people to uh, talk about their experiences across the country, uh, from Seattle to Maryland. And so one of the, the key issues that we identified is the, the increasing amount of trash. Am I? Oh, okay. okay. Uh, all right. I don't know. All right. Thanks. Uh, so the, um, the problem was the increasing uh, amount of trash that we're finding near bins. And that's related to uh, landfill tipping fees. Uh, it's getting more expensive for people to actually uh, dispose of other things, and they find it convenient to dump their trash around bins. So that creates uh, some negative uh, uh, imagery for, for, for the bins, um, and so we, you know, we work to, to try to resolve that by, um, uh, of course, cleaning things up, uh, and also uh, establishing uh, better communication with our competitors, um, so that, you know, they are aware when they have some trash so that they could get it cleaned up. Um, we also um, uh, want to develop uh, relationships with local governments in a preemptive fashion, so not waiting until uh, problems arise and, and then having to deal with them uh, in that way, but to actually reach out to them so that they know who we are. You know, whether it's uh, uh, 
permitting office or even local law enforcement. So if we have a relationship with the police, if they see a, uh, a trash problem, they can contact us. Um, so um, overall, we think that uh, you know, the direction of, of bin regulation is a good thing because um, you know, that tends to control the, the unscrupulous uh, operators out there and makes it a more level playing field. And that's it. Perfect. Thank you. There's a the volunteer. Hello, everyone. I'm Gabriella from New York. News again. Um, so our table number eight, we discussed um, the second question, which is how to attract and retain talented and affordable labor. And we all agree that it all boils down to respecting all employees and caring for everyone's opinions and, you know, just caring, per personal or within the, just their labor and also support um, financially, mentally, um, just listening to everyone, making sure that everyone's on the same page constantly. And that's about it. I think that's the, you know, the best way. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I saw a couple more hands in the back. Oh, sure, I'm right here. Hi, I'm Kim from Planet Aid Cleveland. Um, the question that we talked about was the bin regulations. What are the challenges in bin collection in your respective cities or states? Um, in Cleveland, we have 22 past ordinances, so we work a lot with this. And some of the challenges, the most important is the cost. We have to pay the cities to place our bins. Um, we're paying for permits, and then the cities are not even following the registration for the other companies. A for-profit company, we could have a non-profit ordinance, and a for-profit company could come in there and place their bins, and the city doesn't do anything about it. Um, we also talked about um, the restrictions on zoning with the residential. Um, some cities, you can only place bins in a, in a certain district or a certain zoning. Um, that's a problem that we're having in Cleveland. Um, and limiting the number of bins. If they have a city with a certain size, then they say you can only place five bins in the entire city. Um, and then a lot of the cities, they don't understand that our pounds recycled actually go into their state's recycling numbers. So we have to educate them better on knowing that not just paper, plastic, glass, those numbers, um, they have to include ours because they have a certain standard with the EPA to my understanding and each year it goes up. So if they include our numbers in pounds recycled, they would grow their recycling tremendously. Um, and then we just really need to get the cities to buy into it, to stand behind us, to be our back, to understand everything that we do and why we do it. And that's what we discussed. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> May I ask someone who uh, talked about the EAC ban? Yeah. All right. I am. <laughs> Casina. Oh, I have to stand up? Okay. So, uh, we've had the discussion on the, uh, the ESC ban on used clothing. Um, I'm assuming that everybody here knows what the ESC is. Okay. So the, e okay. so, the ESC is an organization, an East African organization, something miniature to the EU. It comprises of Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Malawi, up to as far as we for, for now. So, collectively, they have proposed banning the importation of used clothing into East Africa. And East Africa is a big market for our product. It's, it's actually very, very important to, to me and to my company because 
and I'm not, if it's okay, if I'll just say, but we, we ship out about 550 million pounds of clothing and 25 million pounds of shoes. So it really, really affects us, this band, and a big part of our product goes to that market. So what I think is, is happening, and this is just my own personal feelings and from traveling to Africa and everywhere else, is um, y Uganda, for instance, Uganda has increased their taxes by 5%. And um, they're talking about banning used clothing, banning used clothing, banning used clothing. So the focus is on banning used clothing, and then the taxes go up, uh, the duties go up. So it's okay, we'll pay another 5% more duty rather than having the clothing banned. Does that make sense? And then, you know, six months later, we're going to ban used clothing, we're going to ban used clothing, and the duties go up. So, yeah, we'll pay the extra 5% again rather than having the clothes. You know, it's, this is game that's being played, and I feel very strongly there will come a point where they will hit a sweet spot, where they've, I have near to a hand, <laughs> where they will, you know, the, the ban can only sustain so much, and then we're gonna ban used clothing, won't mean anything. So that's, that's, that's one part of what I just personally feel, I'm not you know, representing anything else, but also I think, um, and Vance adhered to that, they don't really have truly the infrastructure for sustained manufacturing, um, water, electricity, transportation, all of those things. And also, if they were to manufacture it locally, Will the people that buy, the masses that buy the used clothing, be able to afford this locally manufactured product? Will there be sufficient locally manufactured product supply this huge mass? So there, there's a lot of issues rather than just pure ban. That's my personal feeling. I can talk about this forever because it's very close to what I do, so I think I'll end right there. But if anybody's got any questions, I will gladly answer. Thank More you, questions, Christina. that's good. <laughs> She's very passionate. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, anybody from customs? Anyone that had a customs question? Table 12, Mr. Joe. Thank you. So our question is customs issues. How to best manage difficulties encountered at the ports of origin and destination? So first thing we said was know and understand the regulations and requirements for each country involved. There's some countries that involve fumigation um, and you don't want any sort of holdups. The second is to make sure all paperwork is accurate and in order. That's uh, another major hiccup spot. That's what we had. Thank you. Short and sweet. Concise. Joe. Sure. 